welcome back. So the next speaker is uh, Nick Ryder, who is going to talk on uh, exponential normal bounds for spectral representations of polyhedron codes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of this final workshop for having me. Um, this is joint work with Prasad Raghavendra, Nikhil Srivastava, and Benjamin Bites. Um, so I'm going to start off by you know, letting, laying some background and definitions that we've probably seen many times this week. Um, so the kind of motivation for this work is studying hyperbolic programming as a convex programming primitive. Um, and as we've seen, there's lots of open questions on the precise relationship between hyperbolic programming and semi-definite programming. Um, and so there are some results in this field. Uh, one such result is results on the complexity of the representations for specific polynomials. So by uh, complexity of representation here, I mean size of the representation. And uh, the kind of generic question we set out to answer, or partially answer, is what kind of worst case complexity can we expect? Which hopefully I'll make rigorous in a moment. Okay, so some definitions. So, uh, I'll be using as a ground set of variables x1 through xn. My polynomials will be homogeneous. And my degree will be d, n variables. Uh, so you know we, we have hyperbolicity uh, with respect to some direction e if all linear restrictions in direction e are real rooted. And with hyperbolicity, we get a uh, signified convex open cone called the hyperbolicity cone. And here I've kind of drawn you know, the quintessential example where we're uh, hyperbolic in the direction pointing upwards. And so our cone here is this cone right here. OK. And so the relationship to STPs, which I don't need to belabor, is uh, we take a collection of symmetric matrices, and we form a determinantal polynomial from them. And I do some normalization here, just so I can get the all ones vector to be uh, in the hyperbolicity cone then this is a hyperbolic polynomial <coughs> equivalent to the spectral theorem. And the hyperbolicity cone here is a slice of the cone of STP matrices. Um, and so here the geometric object we're optimizing over is equivalent to STPs. And so you know, there's a bunch of questions asking kind of what happens when you take a generic, whatever that might mean, uh, hyperbolic polynomial. And, uh, some you know, affirmative and negative results in this area. Uh, one is Helen Vinikov, which says if you take a trivariate hyperbolic polynomial, it can be exactly written as a determinantal polynomial. So this means all trivariate hyperbolic polynomials, you know, somehow doing optimization over them is equivalent to STPs. Um, you know, kind of influenced or uh, inspired by the, the geometric relaxation of this, one might try to take radicals of this. Uh, so you can see that once you go past trivariate, uh, dimension counting shows you can't get determinantal polynomials anymore. You also can't, you can find uh, explicit examples, Brondin constructed one, uh, where even taking high powers won't yield a determinantal representation. <coughs> um, and so then we have this geometric relaxation. If we can't encode our polynomial itself as a determinantal uh, polynomial, can we look at the geometric space we're optimizing over and say that those are equivalent, that all hyperbolicity cones are in fact slices of the SDP cone? And this is open. But this is somehow like a qualitative statement. This says that uh, if I want to do hyperbolic programming, the geometric sets I'm optimizing over can always be written as the same geometric sets I'm optimizing over in STPs. But it's not a quantitative statement. It doesn't say anything about uh, the relative complexity of these representations. So even if I did get this, I could end up, maybe it's a naive hope, but one could uh, end up with a, a problem which is easy to optimize over in hyperbolic land, and you can, you know, you can say, okay, sure, the hyperbolicity cone is an STP, but maybe that STP is exponential, doubly exponential, et cetera, and so hard to optimize over in uh, the S, uh, STP world. Uh, another result that's quite nice here is it's known that uh, if you have a smooth hyperbolicity uh, cone, which is just some genericness uh, assumption, that uh, they can be written as projections of spectra, slices of the spectrohedral, or sorry, slices of spectrohedrons. Um, so uh, this gives us some nice generic result, but it's still projections. It's not uh, 
exactly at SDP. Okay, so let's talk about complexity, which is what I'm interested in this talk. So for some explicit classes of polynomials, people have uh, constructed spectator representations of varying sizes. Um, and your question is kind of how, how, what's the smallest you can get? If I give you a polynomial, what's the smallest spectrohedral representation I can realize it as? Um, so an example of this is if you take the uh, elementary symmetric polynomials, which I'll be talking about a lot in this talk, uh, Rondin showed that there's an exponentially sized spectrohedral representation for them. And so uh, the question is, what are the worst case scenarios? If I give you a kind of random hyperbolic polynomial, what do I expect the size of the spectrohedral representation to be? So yet again, a spectrohedral representation to me is uh, a bunch of matrices where I can write the, uh, the hyperbolicity cone as the hyperbolicity cone of the determinant of the sum xiai. And so by complexity, I mean the size of these matrices. How big, what's the smallest matrices I can find to encode this geometric object? Okay, so this is our main theorem. Um, the wording isn't very particular. Hopefully I'll give you the essence of it. Uh, and it says that we, we find a family uh, of polynomials of increasing degree and number of variables um, such that if there are spectrohedral representations for these polynomials, they have to be exponentially large. Um, so if you want this exact result as I just said it, there's an algebraic way to do this, pointed out by Cynthia Vincent. Um, our proof is analytic, so we get something a little bit more for free, which is uh, not only do we find a family of polynomials which have exponentially sized spectrohedral representations, but also any approximate spectrohedral representation also has to be exponentially large. So this is what we're going to set out to prove. This is the main theorem in our paper. So uh, the rest of the talk will be me kind of uh, stepping through how we got, uh, got to this result. And uh, I think there's some nice machinery along the way that can be applied elsewhere. Uh, it's kind of, uh, we quickly reached some challenges on how to study specific objects. And uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done here. So hopefully some of these techniques will help. And this is just existential, right? Not like explicit. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I can talk on that more in the end. But that's a great question. Yeah. So a really natural question is, can you come up with an explicit family of polynomials? Mm -hmm. um, that would be really fantastic. I mean, a great candidate would be the elementary symmetric polynomials. We're going to end up taking small perturbations of the elementary symmetric polynomials. Um, so yeah, it'd be really nice if you could show uh, an exact problem. And it does like beg the question, you know, OK, you've shown that there's this family of polynomials, which has exponentially sized spectrohedron. But can you say anything about them being nice in the hyperbolic world? And the answer is no, not yet. OK. So what are the uh, objects I'm interested in in this talk? I have my hyperbolic polynomials. Associated to my hyperbolic polynomials, I have the geometric object, which is my hyperbolicity cones, open convex cones. And then associated to the hyperbolicity cones, I have spectrohedral representations, which I'm thinking of as tuples of matrices. Maybe I should write that So some of these spaces are nice, some of these maps are nice, some of these spaces aren't nice, some of these maps aren't nice. So hyperbolic polynomials, uh, pretty well behaved. Uh, it's a sub, we view it as a subset of homogeneous polynomials, degree d. Uh, it's known that it had, this set has non-empty interior. Um, and so this is a nice set. It's an open set within uh, just uh, the set of polynomials. It has uh, dimension exponential and n and d. Hyperbolicity cones, less well behaved. Uh, so now we're looking at the space of all uh, open convex cones containing one. Uh, harder to say stuff about this space. Uh, for example, questions of dimensionality. Spectrohedral representations, again, I'm thinking of as n tuples of b by b symmetric matrices. b here is the uh, eventual size of the spectrohedral representations I'm ending up with. 
So it's a very nice space, and it has well-understood dimension. And so kind of what would be the goal, the goal would be if all of this behaved nicely and was you know, uh, locally injective and the such, then we'd have some exponential size space here. We could take some open ball here, push it over, push it over, end up with some open ball here. Uh, and that's going to give us lower bounds on B. Since uh, the, the final space dimension is polynomial in B, and the first space dimension is exponential in N and D, it should say that B has to be pretty large. Uh, but there's some problems with this. I mean, A, this space is not so nice, and B, this, this map I, I haven't constructed. I don't even know if it exists. It's, you know, the map that says every hypervelicity cone has a spectral Hedo representation, so we can't really uh, assume anything about that. So what are we going to do instead? Well, we, we really only want some crude uh, estimate here, and so what we're going to do is a packing argument. So what do I mean by packing argument? Well, if I'm sitting over here in my nice Euclidean space, uh, and I have you know, doubly exponentially points that are, are not too close together and live in some uh, bounded ball that's not growing too quickly, then by some just trivial uh, volume argument, I'm going to get some bound on the dimension. I'm going to be able to say, well, all of my points are, have some minimal distance, and so I can put a small ball around them, measure their volume, and then I have the volume of the overall, uh, the overall sphere, and that's going to give me some uh, way to control the size of B. Uh, and the, the benefit of this is I don't need to use any uh, continuity or differentiability along the way. Uh, I can just explicitly find some uh, small collection of hyperbolic polynomials, map them over under these two maps, and what do I really need to show? I really need to show that their parallel distances don't get too close. And at the end, they're in some bounded ball. So that's going to be the essence of our approach. So we end up constructing a, a hypercube of hyperbolic polynomials. <coughs> and this is the most challenging step. So this is what I'll kind of belabor the most. And it has some nice ideas in it. Um, once you have this hypercube of hyperbolic polynomials, you have to somehow show the hypervelicity cones don't get too close. Somewhat challenging, but not too hard. And then the final step is quite easy, as we'll see. Okay, is the setup clear? Okay. And one of the nice things about this approach is we have a lot of flexibility. Uh, kind of the dimension of our starting space needs to be exponential in N and D, which equates to be having doubly exponentially points in N and D. Um, but the, the distances don't get too close, so I have a lot of flexibility. Basically, it's allowed to be singly exponentially close. It just can't get doubly exponentially close. And so because of this, we get very uh, kind of crude approaches everywhere we go, because as long as we're not picking up a double exponential factor uh, in shrinking between our, you know, from our polynomials to our cones and our cones to spectrohedral representations, in the end, we'll have the bound we want. So there's a lot of flexibility in this, which is quite nice. Okay. So let's look at the elementary symmetric polynomial. Um, so I'm just going to kind of quickly define it for those who might be unfamiliar. Um, so the elementary symmetric polynomial in n variables of degree d is the sum of all monomials uh, of size d from the ground set. Um, it's multi-affine, meaning that it, no term shows up with power 2. All terms show up with power at most 1. Um, and there's another way to see it, which will prove fruitful. Uh, in a moment. So if we take the, uh, the elementary symmetric polynomial of degree n in n variables, which we should note is just this. It's just a single monomial containing all of the variables. And I take iterated directional derivatives in the all ones direction, then I will end up uh, in the end with the elementary symmetric polynomial of degree d. And this is nice because this immediately shows that the elementary symmetric polynomial degree d is hyperbolic. So if you uh, take directional derivatives with respect to a uh, vector in the hypervelicity cone, we preserve hypervelicity, basically just because directional derivative will uh, correspond to a univariate derivative on the linear restrictions. And since my linear restrictions are real rooted, the derivatives are real rooted. So therefore, uh, the directional derivative preserves hypervelicity. Um, so somehow I like to think of the elementary symmetric polynom polynomial as this canonical hyperbolic polynomial, but it turns out it lives on the boundary of hyperbolic polynomials. Uh, and it's not too hard to see this, so I think it's uh, fruitful to think about it. 
So uh, the boundary of the set of hyperbolic polynomials has been characterized. Uh, the boundary of the set of hyperbolic, so what is a hyperbolic polynomial? It's one in which uh, when we look at all linear restrictions in some fixed direction, it's real rooted. And so what is the boundary? It's when one of these linear restrictions has a, a root of multiplicity. So we're in the interior of the space of hyperbolic polynomials when all of our linear restrictions are simple rooted. Um, and so the question is, uh, for which elementary symmetric polynomials do I have a restriction that has a multiple root? Um, and it's not that hard to see because uh, of this observation that um, you know, my directional derivative is commuting, uh, or kind of quote unquote commuting with univariate derivative on the restrictions. And uh, so then my, uni my uh, restriction for the elementary symmetric polynomial degree d uh, will have a repeated root if and only if at the very top I had a root of multiplicity n minus d plus 2. Uh, and it's not hard to see here that uh, when we're looking at the multiplicity of restrictions of En, what's going to happen? Well, the, uh, the roots are going to be exactly the coordinates of my vector. And so uh, uh, this restriction will have a root of multiplicity um, n minus d plus 2 if and only if n minus d plus 2 of the coordinates are the same. It's going to happen whenever d is greater than 2. We're going to be able to find examples of that. So for d greater than 2, elementary symmetric polynomials on the boundary set of hyperbolic polynomials. And this is a bit of a bummer, because if we wanted to just kind of generically do this argument, we would take the elementary symmetric polynomial and we do random perturbations around it. We'd say these random perturbations behave nicely, the hyperbolicity cones are you know, far apart, and we keep going. But we can't do random perturbations, because we're on the boundary. So we need to be uh, more clever with our perturbations, and that's what we do. We find uh, a collection of perturbations that will stay hyperbolic. Um, but these restrictions, these troublesome restrictions, are really what we're going to focus on. So uh, I'm going to call these restrictions where n minus d plus 2 of the coordinates of x are the same, troublesome or high multiplicity or whatnot. Um, and so one neither necessary nor sufficient condition, but nice condition, would be uh, if we pick perturbations which vanish on these restrictions. <coughs> these restrictions are real-rooted polynomials with uh, roots of high multiplicity. Um, and now we want to perturb them. So one nice thing would just be if our multivariate polynomial on these restrictions was identically 0. We wouldn't have to worry about maybe perturbing the polynomial and introducing complex roots. Another neither necessary or sufficient condition is to find uh, multivariate polynomials, which we're going to perturb our elementary symmetric polynomial by, such that they're uh, translation invariant in the all ones direction. What do I mean by that? So what do I want to do? I want to take the elementary symmetric polynomial, and I want to perturb it a bit. And I want to end up with a hyperbolic polynomial. Um, so if I have translation invariance in the all ones direction, then that means that when I'm looking at a linear restriction of this, which I want to be real rooted for all x, uh, by translation invariance, this only depends on x, and no longer depends on t. So as a polynomial in t, I'm just taking this, uh, this restriction, and I'm shifting the plot up or down. And so the question becomes kind of, uh, what, what can I say about q of x in terms of my elementary symmetric polynomial in order to keep it real rooted? So it's kind of hard to see, but this is the, the, the x-axis right here. Um, and so uh, I have this real rooted polynomial. And the question is, how much can I uh, add to it? How much, uh, what, what's the magnitude of a constant I can add to it to keep it real rooted? Well, the answer is I can add to it until I hit my first critical point. And so I need q of x to be bounded by the magnitude of my polynomial at, at its critical points, which I've written here. Uh, translation invariance means I can shift this critical point of this graph to be at 0. And so we get this perturbation criteria. We get a sufficient criteria uh, for the kind of perturbations that will preserve hyperbolicity. And elementary symmetric polynomials on the boundary cannot perturb. Uh, yeah, so what I mean by perturb it is I mean, um, so I guess the question I'm explicitly asking is, what is a condition on Q such that edx plus q of x is hyperbolic. So I, yeah, I can't perturb it in all directions, but I can find a specific direction. And so this is sufficient. 
uh, criteria. Um, and it might look a little wonky right now, but it turns out to have uh, kind of a nice qualitative analog that we'll see in a moment. But yeah, so um, ED minus 1 is the derivative of our restriction. Um, and so when what we, what we want is we want to somehow bound our perturbation by the elementary symmetric polynomial when the previous elementary symmetric polynomial vanishes. And I'm not going to go into why this implies this, but one consequence of this criteria is that if x has n minus d plus 2 coordinates, then q of x is 0. So yet again, we get what we want, this nice property that uh, our perturbations uh, vanish on the troublesome restrictions. But yet again, that's not sufficient. OK. So I'm going to kind of pull some perturbations out of thin air here. Uh, so given a dematching on my index set, uh, which maybe looks like this. So here n is, I guess, 9. And I have this d matching, uh, where d is 3. I can construct a polynomial, uh, which is just a product of the differences along the pairs. Um, and I claim if x has n minus d plus 2 of the same coordinates, then this must vanish. So that's like sanity check number 1. We want it to vanish on the troublesome coordinates. Um, and this is not too hard to see. If I, I've indicated here uh, the red ones how, how all have the same coordinate. Uh, there's n minus 2d coordinates here, and there's d pairs. If at any point this happens, I vanish, because I have two of the same coordinates on the same pair, which means their corresponding term will vanish. Um, and so if I have n minus 2d here, that's fine. And then I have one for each of my d pairs. I end up with n minus d. The minute I get above that, it's going to vanish. Notice that this polynomial is homogeneous degree d. It's also translation invariant. Uh, if I add t i or t all ones to this, um, it doesn't change it. And so we get a span of perturbations, um, uh, quote unquote perturbations, uh, which vanish on the troublesome restrictions. But yet again, as was pointed out, you know we're on the boundary, so these are not all going to be hyperbolic. So now the claim is small versions of these are hyperbolic. So I wanted to remind us of our perturbation criteria. So these are lower degree, no? You don't know, No, no, they're the same degree. Same. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking at the elementary small, symmetric polynomial degree D, and no. since this is a D matching. Yeah. OK. So um, I need to somehow quantify the distance. I just pick some. Uh, so how do I do that? I pick some basis on the span of these. Uh, and this choice of basis will be important later. But for now, pick any basis. Um, and I look, at, I look at a perturbation by just looking at its coordinates in that basis. And I'm just going to pick some metric. So I'm going to look at the L1 metric. Um, so it's known that the span of all these polynomials uh, has dimension n choose d minus n choose d minus 1, which is good for us, because that uh, means that this subspace we found is still high enough dimension, it's still exponential in n and d, which is what we wanted. Uh, right? Like, we, we want to show that somehow the exponential, the fact that the space of homogeneous polynomials is exponentially sized implies the space of spectral representations is exponentially sized. Um, but we, we say, oh, we're, we're, we run into a problem. We're on the boundary. And so we might not be able to find uh, kind of uh, a half ball that is uh, of high enough dimension. But it turns out we can. So that's nice. Um, and just using the triangle inequality, you know, we, we need this bound. We need, this, we need to somehow say something about q of x for all x, not just x where n minus d plus 2 of the same coordinates uh, are the same. Um, we can bound q of x in terms of this quantity. Uh, and this quantity is the max over all subsets of size d of the norm of the product of those coordinates. So how are we going to relate these? Um, and so this is kind of my intuition for this, all this that's happening. So this is a nice little uh, problem. If you have a, a real vector x, and the elementary symmetric polynomial degree d and the elementary symmetric polynomial degree d minus 1 vanish uh, when you plug in x, then x has n minus d plus 2 zero coordinates. So this corresponds to the fact that if you have a real rooted polynomial, and two of the inner uh, coefficients adjacent to each other are 0, then all the ones after that have to be 0. Um, you know, by log and cavity or whatnot. Um, and so the question is, can I get an analytic continuation of this? What if I force ed minus 1 to be 0, um, and now I want to say something about n minus e plus 2's uh, coordinates are really close to 0, 
if ED is really small. And so this is the main technical lemma of our paper. Um, turns out to be a bit of a pain, uh, but you can. So if you, this was the quantity that showed up on the previous slide, and it somehow is measuring this, this, this idea. And this says that uh, if we have a real vector, which vanishes, it's uh, d minus 1 degree elementary symmetric polynomial vanishes, then we can control the max of any, uh, the max absolute value of any monomial of size d, so any of the monomials showing up in the elementary symmetric polynomial, we can control its magnitude with the elementary symmetric polynomial degree d. So notice, for example, if uh, this is 0, this implies that this is 0, which implies that every subset of size d has a, is, uh, the, the norm of it, the product is 0, which implies one of these is 0 for each of them, which gives you n minus d plus 2 of them have to be 0. So uh, this is a, uh, a generalization of this kind of nice result. And we only knew how to prove this using kind of machinery using real rooted polynomials, so we did the same thing here. OK. So all of this to say, uh, by, by getting this bound, it's, uh, it's, it's exponential, but we, we were OK with that. We were OK with exponential shrinking. We we're not OK with doubly exponential shrinking. Um, and it, it uh, satisfies our perturbation criteria. So it gives us some idea, then, uh, of this epsilon needed to stay hyperbolic. So what were the takeaways? There was a lot of kind of technical things. The main takeaways are um, we found a, uh, a space, uh, a subspace of perturbations, which is still exponentially sized, still exponential in dimension. Uh, and we've shown that for small enough perturbations, we're still hyperbolic in one direction. Um, and so we, we construct this hypercube uh, of hyperbolic polynomials, where we just, uh, you know, with our basis, pick a bit string, 0 and 1, and then we add epsilon perturbations in that direction. <coughs> Step one. That's the most technical part, I promise. OK. Given perturbations, how do we make meaningful statements about hyperplicity cones? Hyperplicity cones are not the best things to deal with. I'm not going to belabor this. We picked some metric, Hausdorff distance. Uh, Hausdorff's dif Hausdorff distance is uh, asymmetric, so we symmetrized it. Uh, and then the general idea is pick, pick a vector of uh, norm 1 in one of your cones and look at its distance to the other cone. Find the max distance among all those. So one nice thing about this definition uh, is it turns out, as I'll, I'll kind of show you with picture proof, that we can show two cones are far apart if we show they're far apart on a linear restriction. And we do like linear restrictions because we're dealing with hyperbolic polynomials after all. Um, but we need to be able to say something meaningful about uh, restrictions. So you know, I ended up with this, this hypercube of polynomials, uh, and it's not clear that it's going to be very e easy to analyze their hyperbolicity cones or anything about their restrictions. Um, and so, yeah, so our goal is to pick some restrictions. We pick indicator functions uh, on d variables in the index set. And then when we take two of my hyperbolicity cones corresponding to two of my polynomials in my hypercube, I want to find a restriction for which they're far enough apart. And then I want to argue that that means their hyperbolicity cones are far apart. OK. Um, so you can, we remember, our, all of our restrictions are uh, shifting. And so um, we have, for any given restriction, because uh, our linear restriction, our, all of our perturbations are translation invariant. Um, and so this is just some constant. Um, and we're looking specifically at the linear restrictions on the indicator functions. And so it'd be nice if we can control this. This is just some constant. It'd be nice if we could have some guarantees on it. Uh, and so one question is, uh, when I take this, these indicator functions, and I have my matching, 
I'm filling in my, uh, my coordinates with d1s and the rest zeros. When is this non-vanishing? Well, if any two of these are both 0, it vanishes. And if any two of these are both 1, it vanishes. And so it's non-vanishing exactly when my subset s touches each of, my matchings, or the, each of the edges of my matching exactly once. And so we call this fully crossing. Um, and basically, we take a further restriction of our space. Uh, so we don't use all of our perturbations. We pick a subset of perturbations such that uh, for uh, any given matching, there is some restriction on which it doesn't vanish, and it's the only such matching on, for which on that restriction it doesn't vanish. And you, we're really abusing the fact we have a lot of flexibility here. We only need doubly exponentially points, so we can cut off these factors as much as we like. Technical lemma, but this is kind of the, the goal. So I end up with two points in this hypercube of... Um, polynomials, and uh, you know, they have two completely different bit strings. And I want to be able to compare them all, depending, regardless of which pair of points, uh, polynomials I picked, I want to be able to compare the restrictions equally. And this allows us to do this, because now if I take any two different bit strings, they, they're different bit strings, so they differ on some matching uh, polynomial we've picked. And on that matching polynomial, we can find a restriction for which uh, all the other uh, terms in my sum vanish. And for one of my bit strings, it doesn't vanish. And for the other one, it does. And so now, regardless of which pairs I picked of points in my hypercube, I found a restriction where it looks the same, up to symmetry. Furthermore, uh, the Jacobi polynomial pops up. So when we look at these linear restrictions, we have the Jacobi polynomial. And so we have this picture where uh, along this linear restriction, I have a Jacobi polynomial. Uh, the max root is here. and uh, for my other uh, hyperplicity cone, it's the max root of taking the Jacobi polynomial and shifting it by epsilon. So I just need to study the effect of the largest root of the Jacobi polynomial by shifting it by epsilon. So this really big ch chunk of text, which is this technical lemma I couldn't figure out how to make intuitive, uh, just says that we can treat all pairs equally. If I take any two pairs of uh, polynomials in my hypercube, we can view them the same. OK. Well, that's great and all, but how do I actually get distance on the cones? Well, it's not all that bad. Once I have distance on the uh, restrictions, because all my pairs look the same, I only have to analyze one setup. And now I just need to say that somehow when I, I project and I, and I find this tangent plane to my uh, convex cone, uh, things are not so bad. But all I need to show is that the, hyper, the hyperplane uh, didn't move too much. So if this is the hyperplane of the Jacobi polynomial, the cone of the Jacobi polynomial, I can analyze this directly. And this is the perturbation. I show it doesn't move too much. We're fine. So where are we now? We had uh, doubly exponentially many hyperbolic polynomials in this hypercube. We wanted to show that when we uh, look at their hyperplicity cones, they don't get too close together. And we managed to, managed to do that by looking at nice restrictions. Finally, spectrohedral representations. So we have this idea of normalized spectrohedral representations. Um, so a spectrohedral representation uh, is just a sum uh, is a determinantal polynomial. Um, and we're going to call them normalized if the, the matrices that show up are positive semi-definite and they sum to the identity. And it's not hard to show that if you give me a spectrohedral representation and the spectrohedral cone contains the positive orthant, then I can normalize the spectrohedral representation to end up with one of these normalized spectrohedral representations. Um, but which hyperplicity cones contain the positive orthant? Well, if I have a polynomial with all non-negative coefficients that has the L1s vector as a hyperplicity vector, then because it has non-negative coefficients, it doesn't vanish in the positive orthant, and therefore it contains the positive orthant as a hyperplicity cone. Um, are we in this scenario? Yes. So we're looking at perturbations of the elementary symmetric polynomial. Not restrictions anymore. Uh, and the key observation is that these are all multi-affine. The elementary symmetric polynomial contains every term possible in a multi-affine polynomial with uh, coefficient 1. And we're just perturbing those coefficients by a small, small amount. And so uh, we're just going to take all these coefficients, uh, which are 1, 
and we're going to perturb them by epsilon. So we're going to end up with a non-negative polynomial. And therefore, all of the polynomials we're looking at uh, have non-negative coefficients. All their hyperbolicity cones contain the positive orthant. So we can assume the spectrohedral representations are normalized. I'm not going to belabor this, um, but you know this is a, a, an easy exercise that shows that if you have uh, Cones that are sufficiently far apart, that implies that the matrices have to be sufficiently far apart in kind of pick your favorite matrix metric. And that gets us where we need to be. We constructed doubly exponentially many hyperbolic polynomials. We showed that the, there was a sufficient gap between them uh, such that they were still hyperbolic. We showed that the hyperbolicity cones maintained a, a big enough gap and that the spectrohedral representations also maintained that gap. And so in the end, we end up with doubly exponentially spectrohedral representations. The distance between them doesn't shrink too much. And by that, I mean it's just singly exponential. Um, and the ball that contains them, we didn't really talk much about that. But because they're normalized, they're contained in some trivial ball that's growing polynomially. And so we get, some, uh, we get the same kind of uh, exponential dimension by pushing the packing argument through. OK. Um, future directions which were kind of already mentioned. Um, so one, one direction is, uh, it's known, as I mentioned, that smooth hyperbolicity cones are projections uh, of large spectrohedra. What, what is a worst case scenario in this case? Can we, can we say something generically for all of these smooth hyperbolicity cones? Um, another question is, can we find an explicit polynomial? That would be really desirable, especially if that explicit polynomial uh, was, was nice in the regard that it, it had low complexity in hyperbolic programming. Do you have a precise statement about how far uh, how far the cones, like the approximation of the, the cones, like how far they have to be in the metric? Uh, you mean when we're following this argument through? Yeah. yeah. But uh, we, <laughs> we're admittedly pretty sloppy in this because we were only running after this exponential bound at the end. Um, so for example, like this key technical lemma, which was the main pain, um, I, I don't think this is tight. I don't have any reason to believe this is tight. But this is where you know, we're getting some exponential loss here. Um, and uh, who knows how, how far you could push this. I, I, it's, I think this is a really interesting notion in general, where you, you have this qualitative statement that says if two coefficients in your real rooted polynomial adjacent coefficients vanish, then the rest of them do. And so you have this high multiplicity. And you ask, if you take one of those coefficients and it vanishes, and you take the next one and it's small, what can you say about quote unquote multiplicity? But it's unclear to me that MD is even necessarily the natural object to study in that regard. But yes, we do. Uh, so we have these, these bounds throughout the paper, which tell us how this stuff is moving. So the bound is roughly n to the minus n b, so it's really tiny. Yeah. Any more comments, questions? I ask you, you mentioned that this space of hyperbolistic cones are banned. What, what do you mean more exactly about this? Because uh, I studied this to 30 years ago. <laughs> Them. Yeah, I shouldn't. I should. Uh, I should maybe qualify that they're bad to me because I don't know how to deal with them. I'm sure somebody would look at this and just say, "Oh, that's a very natural space, and it has some probably natural ways to deal with things." Um, but I guess maybe I mean bad relative to the uh, space of tuples of matrices and homogeneous polynomials, <laughs> which are both kind of very uh, easy to work in. Um, you mean some metric properties or some topological properties? Or yeah, no, I think the question was, uh, is there a natural metric to put on it? And if there is or isn't, like, do you have some notion of dimension? Uh, like, uh, you know, should we even be just looking at the space of all open convex cones that contain one? Probably not. I mean, probably there's some smaller space in which uh, the hyperbolicity cones live that maybe it's easier to deal with. comments. Let's uh, thank him again.
starting or resuming in uh, half an hour.